vorbind despre lucruri grele, vom trece acum la o altfel de prezentare, o prezentare despre o abordare agile. Și nu vorbim despre scrum, nu vorbim despre sprinturi, în schimb vorbim despre Kanban. Eu trebuie să recunosc că prima oară când am auzit despre Kanban, mi-a sunat ca o chestie din aia cu tobe, pam pam, taram pam pam. Trebuie să vorbesc, da. O să vorbesc mai încet acum. Ceea ce o să încerce David să ne prezinte astăzi, Uh, va fi ceva mai light. Adică nu o să intrăm acum în uh, uh, toată metodologia Kanban, în toată splendoarea ei, ci o să avem așa un fel de uh, taste, flavor, a ce înseamnă Kanban și în ce măsură am putea să-l folosim în proiectele noastre. Rugămintea pentru voi este uh, să fiți deschiși, să vedeți un instrument care poate fi aplicat în orice fel de proiect. Nu doar în proiectele strict de dezvoltare software. Există oare posibilitatea de a ne folosi de uh, Kanban? Iar răspunsul ar trebui undeva să fie în zona daului, pentru că Kanban nu s-a născut în zona industriei de dezvoltare software. Kanban s-a născut la Toyota, dacă nu mă înșel, acum mulți ani de zile și a fost preluat. Ca urmare, cred eu că e un instrument pe care ar fi bine să-l luăm cu toți în considerare. Iar prezentarea lui David sper să vă convingă de acest lucru. David mi-a spus că a preluat prezentarea pe care a avut-o acum două zile, într-un cadru academic, unde i-au dat două ore să vorbească despre Kanban. Mi-au dat lacrimile. De bucurie, evident, că ne consideră în stare să înghițim toată, toate aceste cunoștințe. Uh, Mi-a spus, în schimb, că azi dimineață, probabil văzuse la crimele mele, am mai tăiat din slide-uri. Deci ceea ce o să vedeți uh, acum este o adaptare pentru o jumătate de oră cât are la dispoziție, dar uh, uh, pentru cei dintre voi care veți fi interesați și veți intra pe site să downloadați prezentarea, sunt păstrate toate slide-urile. Deci noi am făcut acum un hide, dar ele vor fi uh, disponibile pentru cei care vreți să să bați mai în adânc și să vedeți de ce, despre ce a fost în stare să vorbească două ori. Noi o să-i arătăm plăcuțele cum mai ai 10 minute, mai ai 5 minute, nu mai ai... Deci, fără alte multe uh, cuvinte, unde e? Fata ta! Fata ta! Fata David G. Uh, Anderson, astăzi uh, alături de noi, Uh, doar așa, pentru cei care n-ați uh, auzit, uh, pentru trainingul de o zi de mâine cu David, mai sunt încă două lucruri. David? Ok, hai. Uh, according to my watch, I've got 10 minutes. So, um, we'll just start with questions and we'll not bother with the presentation. It's going to be Friday, right? Uh, I'll see what I can do here. There's only uh, so much I can say in a short period of time. But this is the title of a book that I, I wrote three years ago, Kanban Successful Evolution and Change for your Technology Business. And I'll talk just a little bit about how this came about and why we think it's a, a, a significant benefit for a lot of companies. And it's not just about software development, but that's where it started. Okay, so I thought I would tell this story. It has some relevance to this part of the world. In September 2004, a manager at Microsoft, who is a Romanian guy called Dragos Dimitriu, he approached me and he said, I have volunteered to run the department with the worst customer service record in all of Microsoft's IT division. He was a brave Romanian guy. <laughs> and clearly a very smart Romanian guy also because he came and asked me for advice and I went to visit him in his office and he drew a sketch that looked a little like this on his whiteboard to explain what his department did and he said we have three developers and we have three testers 
And all our customer requests, they come from these four product managers who represent different customer departments inside Microsoft, departments like finance, human resources. Uh, and we maintain applications for those departments. So they send us change requests for feature upgrades and regulatory changes and other things that might happen that, that cause the applications to need to be upgraded. And we are supposed to do those upgrades and get them done as fast as possible. And the department is funded by budget that's provided by these four product managers representing the customers. So every time we do something, we have to estimate it and the, uh, the, we tell them how much it's going to cost and they transfer the money from their budget to our budget and then we do the work. This is actually quite interesting that um, internally they were paying in advance. Have you ever worked in a software company where you got paid in advance? <laughs> it's a little curious uh, policy they had. Anyway, uh, when a new request arrives, it gets sent to the developers and to the testers to be estimated. And it turns out the estimate had to be incredibly precise and it would take them about a whole day to make an estimate for, for these relatively small pieces of work that were supposed to take about two weeks or less. And so they'd return back the estimate and these product managers would use that information to calculate things like the business case for the request and they would do their planning and prioritization. And working with Dragos, they would produce a nice looking Gantt chart once a month. And then the developers and the testers, they would follow that Gantt chart and get the work done. The only thing is that the Gantt chart didn't contain any uh, planning for the unplanned arrival of next month's estimate requests. And as a result, this department had 0% on-time delivery. And more than that, as a result of not delivering things on time, many things from this month's plan didn't get finished and they got replanned at the beginning of next month along with everything else. This meant that sometimes things that were promised this month that didn't get done were promised next month and they still didn't get done and promised next month and they still didn't get done and five or six months later maybe they would get done. Now none of this sounds terribly difficult and you think Microsoft employs a lot of smart people, high IQ people well, for several years, previous managers in this department had failed to figure this stuff out. They had 0% on-time delivery, um, and things were not working. It turns out the requests for future work were invisible. They weren't planned. No one was tracking it. It was like it happened by magic until Dragos came along and he said, how much time do you guys spend doing these estimates? And they said, well, seven or eight days a month altogether. You know, small amounts add up to quite a lot of, of uh, time. No one had bothered to ask that question. Oh, and the work they estimated, half of it never got done. So that means about three or four days per month per person was just complete waste. No one had bothered to think about that. Um, in addition, they had some other type of work they referred to as PTC. Nobody knew what the heck a PTC was, <laughs> but they did know that it's top priority. PTCs do not involve developers, only testers, and they're top priority. What are PTCs? Well, we don't really know, but we know they're top priority. Um, later on we discovered PTCs were things like tax table updates for the payroll system. Actually quite important if you want to make payroll with accurate tax deductions, um, which might be why they were top priority. Although actually that was also nonsense because they actually had three or four months to enter those tax table updates into the payroll system but their average delivery time at this point was five and a half months and they had 0% on time. So imagine that you're one of the product managers and you're holding the new tax table updates for the payroll system. 
you're in charge of the finance IT systems and you're thinking, okay, so it's monthly planning time. We've got four months to do these tax table updates, but this bunch of idiots take five and a half months and they never deliver anything when they promise it. What are you going to do? <laughs> you would say, I want it right away, right now. Because you, if you ask for it right now, there's a good chance it might show up within two or three months. <laughs> Uh, so this emergency work was also unplanned and it received the highest priority. So again, it was disruptive. Right, so you see how there's a thinking process we're using here. That if a team is, the performance is lousy, it's probably because of some reason. Some reason that they're being distracted, they're being interrupted, they're being constantly reprioritized. We didn't assume that they were idiots. Nor did we assume that, that they weren't doing it right or that they were unqualified for the work. Just uh, as background, they were using something called the personal software process as their method for doing the software development. Uh, anyone heard of that? Mostly no, a few people. People that are familiar with CMMI and the Software Engineering Institute, that kind of thing. You'll know what personal software process is. So they had a development methodology they were following. They were following it fairly well. That wasn't the problem. Um, so their observed capability was 0% on time because 100% chance of interruption by unplanned work. The planning and prioritization were conducted monthly and this meant that their fastest response to the customer was about six weeks. To do something that should take one to two weeks, typically, they, they would take a minimum of six weeks, but actually the average was five months, and a slow one could take a year. But remember, zero percent on time in terms of what was planned, and half of the things planned were never done. So this is only the things that actually got done. But everything had a business case and was prioritized by return on investment, and every single choice could be justified very accurately by the product manager. Right. What they were doing was, I know this is hard to read at the back, they, they were essentially prioritizing governance over delivery time. That's basically what the next slide says. So I looked at this problem and I thought, okay, a Kanban system will fix this for them. And we did that. And now I'm going to tell you what a Kanban system is and why we do it. These photographs represent a Kanban system or a show a Kanban system which is in use every day in Japan. The, the picture here is taken at the East Gardens of the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. The Imperial Palace is where the Emperor of Japan lives. See, at least some of you got the language joke there. <laughs> and it's a medieval castle. Right? You live in Europe, you know what medieval castles look like. They have big walls around them. And then if it's uh, quite an old uh, one that's been well preserved, there's often an old medieval town around the medieval castle. And the town also has a big stone wall going the whole way around the outside with a few gates in it where they used to let the peasants in and out. Farmers coming with the food and that kind of thing. And this is the same thing here in Japan, except about 120 years ago, they knocked down all the medieval buildings inside here. They're all made of wood because it's Japan, so easy to knock down. And they turned it into a really nice park. But it's a nice park with a massive big stone wall around it and only two gates to get in. The north gate and the east gate, surrounded by a moat full of water, bridges across the moat to go through the gate. So it's a nice city park, as you can see, and there's only two ways in and out. And when you go in, when you walk across the bridge and you go in, someone hands you one of these. It's a plastic card. It's a little small than a credit card and it's about as thick as a poker chip. 
and it says written in English, admission ticket. You don't pay for it. And you carry it around with you while you're inside having a picnic. And when you're leaving, you line up at a kiosk and you give it back. Ever given an admission ticket back to someone? Especially one you didn't pay for? <laughs> These plastic cards are known in Japanese as Kanban, and it literally means signal card. What are they doing with them? What's the purpose of this system? Limit working they are limiting the number of people inside the park. And why would they care to do that? Not to get too crowded. Not to get too crowded, right? It's kind of nice if it was full of you know, a million Japanese people all at the same time. <laughs> It might not be fun anymore and all the plants would get damaged. Okay, so that's a Kanban system and this idea has been adapted into manufacturing industry since the end of the Second World War, roughly speaking, 1947. And I decided that it might be a good idea if we tried it with software development work and this was the first time we tried it with this this department at Microsoft. And so what we adopted was a virtual Kanban system. And if we were going to visualize our process, I, I've done it with this board here, where we've made columns that represent the workflow through the process, the development activity, the testing, user acceptance testing, deployment ready. So I've turned that little stick man drawing into this grid here columns for the workflow, and I've made two rows, one for the change request tickets and another one for the PTC tickets. And then I've grayed this part out because PTCs start in testing. And then we've added virtual Kanban, these numbers at the top of the columns represent the equivalent of those plastic cards. And we've said, okay, the rule will be that there are only three things in development, three change requests, and three things in testing. And we've inserted some cues here, a test ready buffer for the arrival of PTCs primarily, and also to decouple the, the fact that it's not a manufacturing assembly line. How long does it take a programmer to finish coding a change request? And the next one will be a different amount of time. Right, so there's variability here, and this buffer is there to smooth out the variability from this activity to the next one. <coughs> then we have this input buffer here. It says engineering ready. And we have our backlog of proposed change requests. And in the new world, we are not going to estimate these anymore. We're going to change this from a project management style of thinking to a service oriented style of thinking. And the new world will have a contract between this department and the customers which says, as soon as you pick something and put it into this input queue, we will guarantee you delivery in 25 days or less. And we don't actually care how long it takes as long as it's less than 25 days. So we were in a world of five and a half months is the average delivery time and 0% on time delivery. And what we're going to do is stop estimating and stop planning. And in exchange for that, we'll give you 100% on time in 25 days. How do you feel? <laughs> Everyone thought we were crazy until we actually started delivering on that promise 98% of the time. So this is how it works. If the Kanban limit is five and there's one here, we could pull this one that's finished, pull it in here. And then we've only got two and the limit is three. So we have a Kanban that says we can pull something from the engineering ready queue and we can start developing it. And we only have one left in here and we have five in this queue. And what that says is we can start four new things. 
for delivery 25 days from now. So which four of the many, many things in the backlog, usually at least 100, which four of those would you like next for delivery 25 days from now? In the previous presentation, uh, there was some talk about valuing projects and calculating return on investment and different things. When the question's as simple as pick the four things you want for 25 days from now, no one cares about the return on investment. Uh, that's an urgency related question. Right? It's a cost of delay related question. What, what thing is worth the most to you 25 days from now? That's the mindset that you have in order to pick something. It turns out people can answer that question very quickly. So we can pull four things from the backlog into the input. Meanwhile, I've designed this so that the PTCs are allowed to break these limits. And if we get a tester distracted here, we will mark this one as blocked, and that tester will work on this ticket here. Right. So this is the design. And this is more or less what we did, although it didn't have a visual board. What were the results? I have the real data for this. I, I know it looks like a sketch, but it is real data. And this is the quantity of change requests completed, and this is in quarters, starting in the fourth quarter of 2004 to the first quarter of 2006. Introducing the Kanban system more than trebled the productivity of this department without changing the way they were doing the software development or the testing. The delivery time fell from an average of about 140, initially leveling out here at about 80. Then we did a little bit of shuffling with the staff. We moved one tester into development so that we had four and two. And this happened. We took the delivery time down from 140 days to 12 on average, and the on-time delivery percentage went from 0 to 98% against that 25-day promise. So that worked fairly well. Drivers got promoted, given additional responsibilities. Then his general manager moved over to a company called Avanad, which is a Microsoft and Accenture joint venture company, where he became the CIO, and he brought Dragos with him to become the head of global IT infrastructure. That was the equivalent of like five pay grades worth of promotion in only a year. Occasionally good stuff happens to good people because they do good things. <laughs> Mostly the reward for doing good things is more work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about how Kanban systems work. The key thing in a Kanban system is that commitment is deferred. The idea that why would you waste energy on anything you're not ready to start? And are you even really sure that you want it yet? How many of you work in companies where developers or testers complain that they're constantly dragged in one direction or another because business owners and marketing people keep changing their minds? Anybody? <coughs> what about too much multitasking because you're asked to start lots and lots of things and people can't seem to focus down on what's the most important. Uh, all of these are genuine problems. And Kanban systems force that issue. They, they, they force the issue of there's only a limited number of things we're going to have in progress. And what are the four things you really, really want next? Because once we've picked that thing, it better not get discarded because we're going to put it on a big visible place and maybe print out a nice report and mail it to everyone saying, here's all the stuff that we started that you didn't really want. Uh, we've done that for real. Mailed out a report once a month saying, here's all the wasted energy we had on stuff that you asked us to start that you didn't want. 
Five months later, that report was empty. Because when you start showing people the consequences of their poor quality decisions, you know what? They start making better quality decisions. So we wish to avoid discarding after we pick something. And now my little clicker is not clicking, so we we'll switch itself off. What's happened to the PC? I seem to have a mouse rather than a clicker. Okay, so we put stuff in here, and that's the commitment point. At the point when we pull it into the Kanban system, we're saying we really, really want this, and we're absolutely sure we want it, and we're absolutely sure that we're not going to change our mind about it. That can be a tough question, but it makes life a whole lot easier for people. So we're committing to getting started. We're certain we want to take delivery. The implication, therefore, is that our backlog remains optional and ideally unprioritized. There is no point in wasting energy prioritizing things when you're going to change your mind tomorrow, the next day, next week, next month. Don't waste energy on prioritizing because all you do is reprioritize. It's great work, <laughs> if that's what you get paid for, but why would anyone else pay you for it? Really? This also implies the word backlog is not a good choice of word in English, because backlog has an implication of commitment. So, it's better to think of things that are uncommitted as a pool of ideas, they're still optional. Cool with two O's and not a U, what a funny language English is. <laughs> Discard rates are often high. Would anyone like to speculate? So imagine we've got some backlog of work for a department. Maybe it's a project backlog. What do you think a typical discard rate is in most organizations? Anyone got any real examples? How many things did you actually spend time elaborating, writing down the requirements that don't actually get done? Typical percentage? More than half. More than half. I like you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the number that comes up, and now you're helping me with my average sample set here, the number that comes up most times when I ask this in public, so rejected would be we're never going to start at all. Is 50%. In other words, the 48% we encountered at Microsoft back in 2004 is actually very, very typical. Why does this happen? Why is it we come up with lots of ideas that we're kind of sure we want because we spend time and energy on them and then we don't do them? Asking is cheap. Asking is cheap. <laughs> so people have objectives and goals, and the objective might be to win a lot of money at the casino. <laughs> and I believe that I will do that, I will achieve that goal if I bet on every possible number. <laughs> uh, so you're right, asking is cheap. Right? Coming up with ideas is cheap, and the more ideas I come up with, the more chance I have of winning. If only implementing all those ideas was free. <laughs> right? So actually we throw away a tremendous number of ideas and the reason for it is because the future is uncertain. We do not have a crystal ball and if we do have one it doesn't work. So discard rates are high. The cor corollary of that is a 0% discard rate implies that you know everything about the future. You're absolutely sure that you know the future. How many IT projects does that apply to? Pretty much none. So you're always going to throw stuff away. So the question is, how much energy do you want to spend upstream on things you're going to throw away? Right? How much money do you pay those people? And they're usually not IT people, so we account for them differently. 
they're usually pure operating experience in companies. Walk into the CFO's office and say, hey, do you know you've got a product management department with 100 people in it and half of what they do gets thrown away? <laughs> and that goes straight onto your P&L as a negative number, right? CFOs are real. Really? <laughs> Right, so deferring commitment and avoiding interrupting workers for estimates makes sense when discard rates are high. Right. When discard rates are high, it implies we need lots and lots of very cheap ideas. And if we keep interrupting the guys doing the real work in order to elaborate those supposedly free or very cheap ideas, we'll get nothing done. This turns out to be incredibly common all over the world. Any software developers in the room here? It's all project managers, one or two who don't really want to raise a hand. Okay, those of you who are software developers or testers, do you ever get interrupted to do unplanned work? Everyone in the room is nodding. So it could be estimation, it could be analysis, it could be help the sales guy with a demo for some future customer. You know, it could be some sort of customer care, third-tier support call, all of these things blow our predictability out of the water and then people complain you never deliver anything on time. Kanban systems get that stuff under control. Replenishment frequency, the next thing we're going to worry about is how often should we refill this input queue here? How often should we have that meeting to say there's four slots free in the queue, which four things do you want next? Well, the answer, of course, is as often as possible. So this is uh, you know, re replenishing the queue. Frequent replenishment is more agile with a little A on here, not religious, big capital A, agile software development. Um, there is no point in holding a meeting if no new information has arrived since the last time you held the meeting. So if you live in a fairly dull and boring environment where information arrives very slowly, maybe some parts of the public sector, for example, then maybe you don't need to hold the meeting too often. On the other hand, if you work in the media industry, say TV news, maybe the website for a TV news station. You probably want to hold that meeting every day. The media industry worldwide loves Kanban, and they love it for this kind of reason. Some of the best case studies we have around the world, the BBC Public Broadcasting Service, BBC Worldwide, 20 or 30 different departments there doing Kanban, some of them making millions of extra dollars in revenue because they adopted the use of it. Uh, well, Global in Sao Paulo, South America's largest newspaper, has a really large scale implementation. The Lonely Planet, the Financial Times, Time Warner, uh, the list goes on and on. Mobila Day, which is the auto trader company in Germany. Um, the media love Kanban because of this. On-demand replenishment would be the most agile. Every time we have one slot free in the queue, we say, what well, one thing do you want next? Next thing is delivery frequency. How often should we deliver a batch of stuff that's finished? And the answer, of course, is as often as the customer is willing to take delivery. Because our cost in making the delivery is usually much less than their cost in taking it. And that often gets overlooked, particularly in the Agile software world, where they love to say, hey, we can do continuous delivery. If your customer doesn't want to take continuous delivery, they actually think you're really, really annoying. <laughs> so frequent deployment is more agile, on-demand deployment is the most agile. This next thing it doesn't often get spotted in Kanban, so I started calling it out explicitly. The commitment to start something isn't necessarily a specific commitment to deliver. Because there'll be some unpredictability in how the ticket moves across the board. So 
why don't we defer committing on a specific delivery or deployment until the ticket's a little bit further over here, until we know more about it? Perhaps even waiting until it's in our deployment ready queue, and then we tell the customer exactly when we're going to deploy it. So a simple mnemonic for this, Kanban uses two-phase commit. All right, but committing to starting it isn't the same as committing to delivering it. The reason is that the batch transfer and deployment is a separate system from the Kanban system that's doing the development and testing. And because of the decoupling of those systems, it makes sense to decouple the commitments. This is very rarely implemented in many Kanban implementations around the world. Last little thing here is, what does lead time mean? Well, the clock starts ticking when we pull something in, because prior to that, it's optional. Just because the customer wrote it down and sent it to you doesn't mean you're going to do it. So the clock doesn't start ticking until the customer shows up at the replenishment meeting. And then it continues until the lead time through the Kanban system continues until it hits the first infinite queue. That's the end of the Kanban system. The overall customer lead time, which is the, the delivery, when the thing is delivered to the customer, requires us to understand the frequency of the batch transfer. And because we only have a half an hour, I haven't shown that. The good news is that the PowerPoint here, you can get access to that. It has about three times more hidden slides than the ones I'm showing you. So if you unhide all the slides, what you get is a two hour university lecture on Kanban. It's a little gift that I'm giving you <coughs> hidden slides. This last one I want to talk about, this idea of flow efficiency, which is all the lead time through our system, some of the time is waiting time, waiting in these queues, for example, and then other time is working time, like development. Now, if we have a lot of multitasking going on, if we have more stuff than we can work on, more than one at a time, then even this working state is actually mostly waiting, because we're time slicing. So it's actually working, waiting, working, waiting, working, waiting, 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 working, waiting. Okay, more audience participation. What do you think a typical flow efficiency? So flow efficiency is the work time divided by the lead time times 100%. What do you think a typical flow efficiency is in our industry? 70%? You do extreme programming maybe? Anybody else? 45? 30? <laughs> Any more bets on that? <laughs> right, so this pop-up just states that the multitasking means that even the, the time we might record in a tracking system, this isn't all working time. Okay, we have some real data coming up here. Um, a guy from Budapest at a conference last year reported this. The team that he managed at that time had 2% flow efficiency. 5 to 15% is normal. A consultant from Sweden called Håkan Forsch measured this with new clients last year. No new client had a flow efficiency greater than 5%. But the time it takes tickets to move across from when you promised it to the customer to when the customer can take delivery is typically 95% or more dead time, waiting time. Um, okay, so let's imagine we're at 5% here, 5% uh, flow efficiency. Let's say 2.5% of that is development time, the other 2.5% is testing time. If we fired the developers we've got because they're clearly idiots, and we replace them with geniuses who are 10 times faster, how much faster did we get at delivering the work to the customer? 
The answer's two percent. <laughs> right? Just think about that. You replace your current workforce with people who are ten times faster, and you get two percent more productive. This is why clients that call me in, very senior executive of a publicly owned British company, once called me in and he said, David, we have spent 14 million British pounds training more than 2,000 people on extreme programming in our company. And it doesn't appear to be making a blind bit of difference to the performance of this business. They must be doing it wrong, go and find out why. <laughs> Of course, the programming wasn't the problem. It's all the not working that's the problem. The big leverage point in improving our industry is to focus on not working. All the delays, all the blocking issues, all the dependencies between one department and another, that's where the performance improvement comes from. Kanban systems force you to focus on that. Because what do you do if you don't have a limit to your work in progress when people get blocked? <coughs> you start something else. And you know what? The work is invisible so we don't notice. There are some really good case studies in our literature. Hewlett Packard, Boise, Idaho, Print of Firmware Division accidentally allowed four and a half years worth of work in progress to get started. Implication being, the next generation of laser printers was going to take four and a half years to be delivered. What would that do to Hewlett Packard's printer business? It would end it, probably about seven years into the future. So, this doesn't happen in other industries because stuff is physical and it's, it's visible. A big Kanban adopter is Volvo. Imagine that every time they started a user story in their IT department, a guy came with a forklift truck and dumped an engine block in their office. Uh, they would notice after a while. <laughs> they wouldn't allow four and a half years worth of engine blocks to accumulate. Uh, so Kanban systems help us focus on the big leverage point in producing organizational improvement the delays in the work. And they don't allow us the opportunity to use the symptomatic fix, which is simply to start something else in the meantime. Because all that does is mean that a customer has now been promised something. Something that you don't know when you're going to deliver. So you're going to break that promise. How does that make the customer feel? Uh, they get upset with you. They lose trust because you break your promises all the time. When you have Kanban systems and you force the hard question at the beginning of what is it you really, really want next, you can keep your promises. So I know I'm out of time, right? I'm out of time. The lady already left. <laughs> she said... Our timekeeper has gone home, so... <laughs> <laughs> so that was an explanation of uh, the use of Kanban systems and it turns out that I was using those as part of a bigger concept <clears throat> that I didn't give a name to and it's just ended up being called the Kanban method. And it's the idea that we use Kanban systems to provoke conversations about process improvement and organizational change. And that's led us to this world of thinking of Kanban as an evolutionary approach to management and the idea that we're using Kanban systems and visualization to install an evolutionary DNA in your organization. And something our previous speaker didn't tell you is that the way that you deal with complexity and complex adaptive systems is you need to be adaptive. That's why they're called adaptive systems. And adaptive means evolutionary. It means you take what you do now and you make a change to it and then you see whether that's an improvement or not, whether it's fit up for its environment, to use the evolutionary language. And if it is, you keep it and maybe you make another change, another one, and another one. And if it's not, you throw it away and you try something else. Kanban provokes those conversations. And I came up with the, there are six things you need to do in your organization to make this work. 
visualize. You have to make the invisible work visible because people that do physical stuff don't make the same mistakes that we make. Limit the work in progress is a shorthand for saying implement a virtual Kanban system. Manage the flow in that system. Focus on the delays. Make all the policies in the system explicit. When people understand the rules, they can also understand how those rules are affecting the, the performance and talk about it. Implement feedback loops I'm going to show you in a minute. And finally, improve collaboratively and involve experimentally. And this is using models and the scientific method. And in half an hour, I don't have time to get into that. The feedback loops, the shorthand for this is something called Kanban Kata, and there are three of them. The stand-up meeting, something called the improvement Kata, and the operations review. And very quickly, what are those? Well, here is a meeting of a team in front of their Kanban board. And you can see from their conversation that something is clearly not working very well in their world. But one of the team is not willing to accept that and says, let's do something about it. Well, what is the problem? Well, it looks like our developer is a bottleneck because she is too busy. And meanwhile, our tester is idle. And our analyst here is stuck because he's waiting on some business owner who's too busy off doing banking to show up for the requirements meeting for the IT system. And what happens next is we describe it as an after meeting. After the regular daily stand-up meeting, some team members hang out and they talk about, OK, it looks like development's a bottleneck. What can we do about it? Testers are idle. Could they help? What if we allowed the testers to work on these blue colored tickets? And then all of a sudden, we've solved the idleness problem, we've solved the bottleneck problem, we just evolved our process by changing a policy. You see how these things fit together? Improvement kata is a mentor-mentee relationship, usually but not always, between a superior and a subordinate. This is the whole business of exactly or what business are you in? So imagine that I am the second line manager, the director of engineering, and uh, your job title is development manager. What business are you in? Let's try this a different way. Imagine that I am the regional director for Starbucks and you manage a Starbucks cafe in town here. What business are you in? Selling cups of coffee. Good, good answer. How many of those did you make today? How many did you make this week? Was that more or less than last week? How many did you make this month? Was that more or less than the same month last year? You get the idea? These people are managers. They manage a business. On the other hand, a typical IT manager thinks that they are a dating agent, that they have a set of very attractive looking engineers, <laughs> and they have an incoming set of tasks, and their job is to match the task with an appropriate date from the department. <laughs> How many of you do this for a living? <laughs> right, you're all nodding. How many cups of coffee did you make today? Right. You all make whatever they're called, use cases, user stories, requirements. How many have you made today, this week, last month? Was that more or less than, than the month before? Is the demand going up or down? What's the nature of the demand? Are people ordering coffee or are they ordering cups of tea? Right. People in our industry don't know what business they're in. This improvement kata is about talking about that one-on-one -on -one and defining target conditions and figuring out how to achieve them. Like our current one-time delivery performance is zero percent and our customers are unhappy. So what would be a suitable target condition? Well, we think 85% on time would probably uh, make it acceptable for the customer. So the question would be, what are you going to do about it? 
the improvement counter. Lastly, the operations review is the idea that there's a monthly meeting of all the people involved in Kanban systems in our organization. Imagine that's like the regional director getting the managers of all the Starbucks from the whole country and having a meeting to talk about how many cups of coffee we've sold in each different store. The thing is that at Starbucks, they don't have dependencies between the stores. You know, if you order the skinny latte, they don't have to fetch the non-fat milk from another store. But that does happen in our world. That's where all the delays come from. So how you address the delays is to have a system of systems feedback loop that enables the cause and effect between one system and another to be exposed and a conversation to be held about it so that we can do something about it. So the three Kanban Kata are the response to the complexity in your world, right? This creates the adaptive system that you require in order to cope with that. And the entire thing is a service-oriented approach. Each Kanban system is wrapped around a service, and you're making that service very reliable and dependable. And then you're looking at the service-oriented architecture using the operations review meeting. You do all of this, and magic really happens in organizations. Some parts of the BBC improved their productivity by 800%. One department that did web pages for the BBC Worldwide generated an additional million dollars a year, 600,000 British pounds, in additional ad revenue because they reduced their lead time and web pages delivered earlier generate ad impressions earlier. Those additional ad impressions added up to 600,000 British pounds in extra revenue from one department of about 20 people. Stuff really gets better. And the percentages that we see in the case studies reported around the world are stunning. Most people are really happy if they do an improvement initiative and they get 20 or 30% improvement out of it. And we see people getting hundreds of percent improvements. Thank you, I used too much of the time. getting scared for other reasons. I see middle managers getting scared that we couldn't possibly have a 600% improvement because people might ask why I didn't do it sooner. <laughs> um, yeah, middle managers are afraid of transparency because they don't want the bad stuff exposed. I also had, um, recently I, I gave a talk to about 75 quite senior executives in the United States. It, it was more or less the talk you've seen, a little bit longer. And a lady put her hand up and she said, so if we limit the web and we have an imbalance between our testers and our developers, many of them will be idle. And I said, yeah, that could happen. She said, I'm pretty sure if I did that in my organization, three quarters of my testers would have nothing to do. What would you recommend? <laughs> And, and I looked at her and I said, why do you need me? <laughs> so this is an interesting situation. This senior executive in this company knew she had four times more testers than she needed. And she wasn't doing anything about it. And she knew instantly from watching my presentation that she implemented Kanban and would expose that. And of course she's afraid of that because she doesn't want 
the CEO asking her, so you've had four times more testers than you needed all along? You know, it's that scene from the, the old Star Trek movie where Captain Kirk discovers that Scotty has been padding his estimates. You guys know this scene? And he says, Mr. Scott, do you mean to tell me that you've been quadrupling your estimates for all the years that I've known you? And he replies and he says, Aye, Captain, how else would I keep my reputation as a miracle worker? <laughs> okay, one more question. Hello. Uh, my boss is a very interesting person. Each time I go to him with an idea or with a project or each time he gives me a project or somebody else gives me a project and I have to report it on my weekly meeting, he said, okay, give me a deadline when this is going to be finished. You know, the projects come in the queue every day and I always have to go with a deadline. And if I don't respect the deadline, excuse me, I am tough. <laughs> the idea is, how can someone present the idea of using Kanban in a business uh, knowing where there is uh, an expectancy to give deadlines to the management or the people you are delivering to? So the, the answer depends a little bit on why they're asking for the deadline. Because they could be asking for a genuine business reason, which is that if we have it delivered for a certain time, it has a certain value, and if it slips later, it has less value. If it was earlier, it had more, and so on. It may be for some very specific date in the calendar, so it's a genuine question. On the other hand, they might be asking you because they assume that you are very lazy, <laughs> and if you don't have a deadline, you wouldn't possibly be working hard enough. And if it's the latter choice, that's a harder problem to deal with. If it's the earlier one, if it's the genuine business reason for when will it be delivered, because there'll be a value associated and risk associated with that, that that's dealt with in the hidden slides in the PowerPoint. That I encourage people to study what really happens in your world. Most companies I meet are actually already recording the lead time for delivery of items because they have ticketing systems and, and so on. Um, you know, um, things like Jira or Team Foundation Server or um, Quality Center. They have all the time that things took. So why don't you analyze the historical data? And so what you'll see in the PowerPoint is that we built histograms out of that historical data, and then we, we shape a distribution curve onto the histogram. And therefore, if someone says, how long will this new thing take, your answer should be based on the probability of, of what you've observed in the past. So when we make a promise like, Thing, the change request will be finished in 25 days or less, that might be based on the 98th percentile, the, the second confidence interval above the mean in the distribution of the historical data. And 98% is as good as 100%, gen, genuinely. So if it's the business question of uh, the risk involved in how long it will take and what it might be worth, uh, I prefer that you address that probabilistically by studying historical data. If it's the problem that your boss thinks you're lazy and that you need to be controlled and that its control mechanism is asking you to meet deadlines, <coughs> that is a discussion for outside during the break. <laughs> Mergem la cafea, pe bune, deci abia uh, mai rezist. Dar mă omoară uh, echipa de organizare care a zis că dacă sunt aici în față, eu trebuie să fac anunțurile. Și eu am grijă de echipa de organizare când mă am pășit de aia. Așa. Uh, reminder. 
cei care trebuie, aveți facturi de ridicat la recepție, este un domn care abia așteaptă să scape de ele. PDU-uri, pentru cei care sunteți certificați PMI, tot la recepție e o listă pe care trebuie să vă lăsați adresa de e-mail ca noi să vă comunicăm codul evenimentului, să puteți să fiți în regulă cu cele șapte PDU-uri pe care le-ați meritat astăzi. Tot echipa scrie așa, formularele de evaluare. Nu uitați că în MAPE aveți un formular de evaluare pe care, dacă îl completați, ne ajutați extrem de mult. Deci vrem să știm cum să calibrăm următorul nostru eveniment în așa fel încât să fie pe placul vostru. Ați văzut că am avut prezentări light, prezentări heavy, prezentări lungi. Am vrea să știm cam cât de mult v-au plăcut, cum v-au plăcut, ce uh, recomandări aveți pentru noi pentru următorul eveniment. Uh, și la uh, tombolă. Să știți că tombola, extragerea premiilor, uh, avem e book de la Lentropen uh, Straton, avem uh, vouchere la sesiunile de training Achieve uh, Global, avem cărți uh, Going Agile de la noi, avem uh, tricouri, avem memory stick-uri, avem cărți Have a Nice Conflict de la Personal Strength. Deci avem o grămadă Uh, și am găsit noi soluția pentru extragerea lor, vom avea o cutie în care vă rugăm să vă uh, puneți uh, beciu. Și noi după aia vă credem pe cuvânt când veniți să vă ridicați uh, premiu, că sunteți voi și nu altcineva. Dacă vin două persoane cu același nume să se vadă pe același beci, dăm două premiu. Ok, e, sunteți mulțumiți cu anunțurile. Dragilor, luăm uh, un sfert de oră pauză ca să ne băm în liniște cafeaua și urmează o sesiune extrem de revigorantă de managementul conflictelor și de instrumente pentru echipa de proiect. Vine soft skills.
colour the distribution based on how big we thought it was, how complex it was. There usually isn't a correlation. Because you would expect if you're, if you're plotting lead time this way, it's quantity divided by two. So you get some sort of shape like that. You'd expect all the small, whole complexity things to be at this end of the distribution and the hard ones to be at this end. Usually it doesn't correlate. So it's not important 